My name is Eric Mesner. Um, I'm a structural engineer. I've been keeping bees about 10 years. Uh, we're running about 25 colonies right now. Um, this is supposed to be geared towards like second, third year beekeepers. How many of you have been keeping bees for fewer than five years? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Lots of people. That's great. Um, I just want to make sure I wasn't preaching to the choir. Um, talking to you today about splitting and merging. So let's dive right in. Um, this is an outline of what I want to talk about. First, we're going to talk about why are we talking about this. Um, then I'm going to mention a little bit about queen rearing, because that's you kind of have to talk about both together a little bit. Then we're going to go over a few splitting methods. At the end, I'm going to talk about merging colonies. It's unlike, this is less likely that you'll need to do this this year. Um, and then we'll talk about equalizing. Um, while I've got this slide up, I just want to say that as I was putting this together, this presentation, I discovered that the topic of splits is not really sympathetic to the engineering mind because I like to put things in categories and buckets and then separate them all out. And in the world of splitting, when it comes to beekeeping, there's like three or four big ideas and then there's all these different variations on a theme. And like you can take methods from one and spill them to another and pretty soon the whole mess gets really gray and cloudy with all the different types of iterations you can use. So I'm gonna try when I'm giving this presentation to kind of be like, these are the general silos, and then you can have fun mixing and matching, and, and uh, when, when using one method with another method works and doesn't work. So uh, we'll see how this goes, but I apologize in advance if it's a little muddled. There's lots of expertise in this room that we'll be able to chime in during the Q&A session at the end, and so hopefully the wisdom of the crowd will uh, bring all the cream to the top. <laughs> okay, why are we talking about this? Um, if, if you haven't seen me give this part of the presentation yet, um, I, I gave this for the uh, seasonal colony management presentation I did for the beginner beekeeper course, and, and anybody who sticks around the club long enough to hear me talk a lot is going to get really sick of me talking about this because I harp on it way too much. Um, but for new beekeepers thinking about a colony, I just because we're all kind of experienced, I just want to remind everyone that we're not talking about individual bees very often. It's much more coherent. It's much more advantageous to think of the colony as a, like a super organism. It's one thing. It's not a bunch of little bees. It's a colony. And when you think about the colony as a super organism, the honey in that animal is the fat. <laughs> it's stored calories is basically what the honey represents. And when you weigh a hive, or if you're hefting it, or kind of getting an idea of how heavy it is, you're mostly getting an idea of how much honey is in there. Yeah, the equipment weighs something. Yeah, the bees weigh something. There's some pollen in there, there's some wax. But when you see the weight, or you feel the weight, like you pick it up and you think, that's light. If you're thinking as an experienced beekeeper, it's light on honey. You're not thinking like, I wonder if they have enough pollen. It's the weight. The weight is the reserve resources of the hive. And I know that in America, uh, being fat is a bad thing because we just have way too much of everything. But biologically speaking, there are good reasons to store fat. Bears eat a whole bunch so that they can hibernate through the winter. Everybody understands that. And in the same way, from a biological standpoint, the fat is valuable because it's excess resources that will get you through tough times. Like have money in the bank account. Um, in this analogy, the bees are not individual bees all standing together. They are the strength of the colony. And so when experienced beekeepers talk about strong colony, weak colony, they're mostly talking about how many bees are in there. Um, and strength doesn't just mean strength like the... Uh, you know, the stronger colony has the ability to collect more resources, even though that is true. But it also means they're better at managing um, pests and disease. It means they can weather, um, you know, uh, setbacks 
better. Um, it also means that, yes, they, they can uh, collect more resources as well. But it's not all, oh man, my, my thing didn't work. It didn't work. It did not work. I had it, it was so cool. I guess it didn't work. Okay, this is supposed to be an animation. But uh, I don't want you to just think always more resources and always more bees is always better. Because when you have more bees, they consume more resources just to survive. And so a, a colony that's super strong, that is not the perfect amount of resources and there's, or there's nothing coming in, will quickly deplete those resources. And so there's a dance. This is supposed to be like a clever thing, but uh, there's, a, there's a dance that we experienced beekeepers try to manage through the season where at some point we want our colony strength to rise, then their resources rise, and then at some point we kind of want their strength to stop rising because um, there's no more resources available. And so, you know, we're con beekeepers are constantly wringing their hands about timing and what's happening with the weather and this sort of thing. Today, when we talk about merging and splitting, we're exclusively talking about colony strength. This is managing the strength of the colony. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about the resources today, even though it's it, you know they're, they're always interrelated. So why would you ever want to split or merge or equalize your colonies? Um, either you have too many bees and you want to make more colonies, or you can tolerate making more colonies. That's when you would split. You don't have enough bees, and you can tolerate having fewer colonies, which is when you would be merging. Or some colonies have less, some have more, and you've got a whole bunch. You're kind of happy with the number that you've got, but if you equalize the number of bees in each colony without messing with the queen or anything, you can have the same amount for everyone. We'll dig deeper into each of these uh, opportunities. Um, timing and the nectar flow. Where was I headed here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still talking about why. We're talking about why would we want to split or merge. You know, if you're a second year beekeeper and you go out and your bees survive the winter, like, rah, rah, we did a great job. Now what are we trying to do? Um, once again, this, this kind of hinges or pivots on what's going on with the nectar flow. You want to make sure you have enough bees to collect the honey that, assuming you want to harvest a honey crop, you want to make sure you have enough bees in there that they can store excess honey. For me, um, the nectar flow starts around uh, May 1st through the 15th, roughly. Uh, from yakking with other beekeepers over the course of 10 years, I have found it seems to me that there is a lot of variation in different microclimates. So this isn't like the dead set rule in Kansas City. Um, it's uh, generally, I think, true, but um, to a certain extent, for your own specific geographic region, your own specific microclimate, there's going to be a little bit of experimentation that you're going to have to do to figure out when's the nectar flow start. And I don't have a, a slide on here for this, but the whole dumb way to make sure to, to, to like signal the nectar flow is to see new white wax somewhere in the hive. The bees are building a lot of white wax. It means they're taking in a lot of resources. It means they're building space to store those resources. And so it's a clue. When you open up a colony and you see white wax in the colony, it should tell you, like, there's resources coming into this hive. Um, for me, like I said, this usually happens in the May 1st to May 15th range. So whatever I'm doing in terms of manipulating how many bees are in each box is relative to the thinking, like, what do I need in May? I've got, a, I've got a second flow. This is the, generally the clover flow. And for me, that happens in June. I think that that's pretty much the same for a, a lot of beekeepers here in Kansas City. And so there's a lot of beekeepers who will miss the spring flow or deliberately dodge it because they want to do something else with their bees during that time. But, but any beekeeper that's keeping their bees for honey, they're thinking about the, the summer flow for sure. Because the summer flow is like, that's the white clover, that's the yellow sweet clover. Uh, that's when most beekeepers in the area are getting their excess, when they're going to harvest excess. So everything that happens 
I didn't, I didn't explain this graph. This, this graph right here, real quick, is the population of bees in a normal hive through the course of the year. So for anybody who hasn't seen this graph before, it comes from Randy Oliver. He got it from um, another beekeeper who meticulously counted each bee and then kept track of their age throughout the course of a season. And so these different colors correspond to different ages. I'm not going to like detail every single point about why this graph is super awesome. But when you see this graph from me, think about this is the, the colony through the season. Uh, this is them coming out of winter. Maybe this laser pointer works. Oh, you can see that. Okay. Uh, so this is them coming out of winter. And then there's a spring turnover where a lot of young bees are replacing old winter bees. And then the population ramps up. And as that population is ramping, They've got more and more foraging, foraging force to go out and collect stuff. And hopefully you timed everything out perfectly so they've got tons of bees right when there's lots of nectar out there for them to just, you know, rapidly take in. The weight of the colony skyrockets. And then there's a, a level off period for us in Kansas City. There's basically like a dearth where stuff stops blooming. If, you garden, if you're a gardener, you know there's not a lot of flowers in August. So that levels off, the bees stop having any resources coming in, that triggers the queen to stop laying, and their population with bee levels, and that's the season. So sorry if I uh, skipped ahead a little bit, but that's the purpose of, so what I'm showing here then is like, these are when the nectar flows hit, so this is kind of when you want your populations to be what they're gonna be. This is from Randy Oliver. I, I did a, a, when I did my uh, seasonal colony management presentation, you've seen me do that before I talk about how colonies grow over time, but Randy has a simple, stupid rule for you that's about two frames per week is what you can expect. And we can have all sorts of fun arguing about when that's true and when it's not true and what maximum egg, rank, egg laying rate is for a queen and what does attrition mean when the egg laying rate goes up and more bees start dying off because they're aging out of the cast. But, um, Without trying to split the atom, just figure if you're running deeps, uh, which is like a classic Langstrom 10 frame deep box, you're going to see about two frames per week on average of growth in like, well, we can argue about when it starts, but probably thinking about it as starting in like February, March, ramping up April, May, and June, and then coming off. So. All of the stuff about merging and splitting starts with how many bees do I want to have in the nectar flow, which Randy's saying you want somewhere between 24 frames and 20 frames, which on deep frames is, is going to be 48,000 bees to 40,000, somewhere in the 40 to 48 range. I, I have a minimum personally of 30,000 bees that I'm trying to have, so on deep frames like this, that's uh, 15 frames of bees is the bare minimum you might want to think about if you want to collect honey for this year. So if you want a minimum of 15 frames on May 1st, just start walking your math backwards, two frames per week, and try to figure out how many bees do you have now, pop those tops, look underneath, make sure that you've got a sense for how many bees you got in there. And if you've got, if you do this math and you come up with, I need, I mean, let's say you, you come up with, you need uh, five or six frames of bees right now in order to hit 30 by, sorry, 15 frames by uh, May 1st. And then you pop your tops and you look in and you've got 10 frames when you needed, whatever I said, six, four, six, whatever. You've got too many bees, and you can do lots of work to try to manage for swarming, or you could think, you know, I bought two boxes, maybe I want two colonies right now, or like I kind of wanted to expand the number of bees I've got this year, or number of colonies, excuse me. And so this is why we're even talking about splitting and merging, because we're talking about managing the strength of the colony so they kind of hit that sweet spot and don't have way too many bees going into and, and, and risk swarming, or don't have not enough bees to collect all of the resources that you want to rob later on the season. Uh, this, this is, like I said, this is courtesy of Randy Albert because I don't have his website. 
Okay, real quick, enough about clean room. It's going to be very difficult for me to talk about this today without muddying the water about clean room. And like, you're going to start splitting your colonies up. You need, like, a colony can be just as few as like a frame of bees with brood and a queen. But how do you get the queen? Where does she come from? That's like, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but introducing queens and uh, surprise Roger, maybe even like a word about raising queens. <laughs> <laughs> will be provided in uh, an our April meeting uh, coming up next month. So I'm going to try to stay out of Roger's hair and uh, let him speak mostly about that. Okay, so digging in, splitting methods and uh, timing. So the first thing that I want to introduce you to, if you're not familiar with it already, is the even split or the walk away split. And then I'm going to like show you some variations on that theme. Um, the walkaway split is the simplest split you can do. It's extremely straightforward. You have two deeps full of bees. This is the old version of the walkaway split. You have bottom, you take one of those boxes, you move it to the bottom, you put your lids on, boom, you're done. Split. So it's more complicated than this, but I want you to, I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to, as we go deeper and deeper into all these different variations, if you're like me, your head's going to start spinning and you're going to start being like, do a little split and reverse queen, you know, reverse swarm, whatever. You're going to get so lost in all the different options. I, I do. And sometimes it's nice to remember that it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as literally just moving the two boxes. But wherever the queen was will make uh, uh, more increase, and wherever she wasn't, if there were eggs there, the bees will raise a new queen from those eggs, and you will be fine. Um, so this is the theory, is that uh, theoretically speaking, your bees are like your nest is sort of somewhere in the middle there, and when you open it up and put the two boxes aside, you get one half on one side and one half on the other side, whichever side didn't have the queen, they make they, they realize they didn't have one and they make what's called an emergency queen cell. Um, so the idea is you're putting about half the bees in one box and half the bees in another box. This gets um, this gets messy when the nest isn't perfectly divided like this. What happens when it's they're all up here or they're all down here? Or what happens if the queen ends up with all the eggs, and the bees that didn't have a queen, somehow by random chance, you didn't leave them with any young, super young larva or eggs to produce a new queen with. Well, they are in trouble. So you have to make sure if you're going to do it this way, or I would strongly, strongly suggest that you check to make sure that both boxes have eggs in them. Because if you're not going to take the time to search for the queen, you need to make sure that both uh, both boxes have the opportunity to make a queen if they need to. Um, so that's that's what I like to do is if, if I'm going to do it this way, and, and the walkway split is is pretty simple. Most uh, experienced beekeepers don't use this method, but they'll also use it from time to time whenever they're super short on time and find something that surprises them in the yard. Um, a slightly better way of doing this to make sure that you get the same number of bees in both boxes is instead of picking one box up and putting it to the side, beekeepers will take a new box, bring it out, and they'll put one frame in wherever the parent colony is going to be, and they put the second frame wherever the new colony is going to be. And then they'll alternate frames like that. If you find a queen, that's a bonus, but you don't have to as long as you make sure that both boxes have eggs in them, this is a better way to make them equal. One colony will end up with the queen. Most people, beekeepers will think of that as the parent colony. And then the split, they'll build their own queen if you do it this way. So if you are just completely overwhelmed by all the stuff that I talked about today, and you still have too many bees in your box, and you want to have two colonies, you can have them by doing this walkaway split, and beekeepers have been doing it for generations, and it fine. Um, a little bit of math on what happens with the colony that doesn't get the queen in it. They are going to produce their own queen if you give them eggs. The day that you split is going to be the 
basically within 24 hours, they're going to realize something's wrong and their queen isn't in there and that they need to go ahead and make a new queen. They're going to find, uh, basically, brood, hopefully, brood is three days old, that an egg has just hatched, I guess on the fourth day is when it hatches. So they're looking, that's what they're going to be looking for. And after uh, they find colony of uh, larvae that have just hatched, they're going to start feeding them a different mixture that the other bees get to turn them into queens. That's how all queens are raised, they're just fed differently. So uh, by day six, you should have a, if you just do the simple math, if you split it by day six, you should have a captive queen cell in there somewhere. They turn one of those eggs and larvae that you've given them into, and, and probably they're going to turn several of them. You're going to see at least a few. Um, at day 13, the new queen emerges. Uh, at 14 days, about, for her to get mated, uh, by uh, day 27, she'll be mated. At another one, she'll start laying as soon as she comes back mated. Um, another 21 days, whoever she started laying is going to start emerging. And so that's a total of 48 days from your split. If you choose to do a walkway split, you should start to expect new bees. From, for that whole 48 days, the colony will not be growing. They'll just be hanging on or doing the wings slightly, yeah. Um, so what things to know. Uh, advantages of the walkway split, it's super easy. Um, hopefully I demonstrate that for you. It takes very little time. Uh, even the more complicated versions of it where you're alternating frames, you can do that pretty fast if you're in a hurry. Um, so number one disadvantage, this is what all these beekeepers are waiting for me to say. Uh, there's some concern that it produces inferior queens because emergency queens are traditionally thought of as being not as high quality. Um, there's some discussion that that's the reason for that is because the bees have to make way more royal jelly to float them out of the cell so that they can build a cell big enough. Because the queen can't just emerge from a worker cell, she needs like a larger cell to emerge from. So the bees float that larva up out of the cell and then build down so that it kind of comes off and hangs down so she has enough space to grow. Another thought is that they're selecting, um, they're trying to select the youngest possible larva that they can but they're gonna select a random assortment of young larva, and some of them might be four days old, and so they might have already been malnourished for a day, and so by the time they emerge, you know, the, the older larva is gonna emerge faster, and she's gonna have an advantage and come out and sting all the other queens to death, so she's gonna be slightly inferior, and since she wasn't fed properly throughout her entire gestation period, but, um, you know, she's still going to come out first because she was the oldest. So, uh, you you also, another possibility is that, uh, so, so, yeah, so so the inferior queens is kind of the number one knock on the walkaway split. Um, you can also end up with population issues if too many foragers return to the parent colony. So while you're doing all this stuff, some beekeepers are out doing their work. And some are going to leave and go do work and they come back. And when they come back, they're going to come back to the original hive they oriented to. So if you, through some like mistake of manipulation, end up sending all of the foragers to your new hive location, and all the nurse bees stay at the original hive location, all those, theoretically, all those foragers are going to leave that, and they're going to come back to the parent, and you're going to end up weak on bees in the split that you made. Hopefully that's clear. Um, but inferior queen is always number one. So, on the spot queen rearing, um, Grant Gillard was talking about this, and he was experimenting with it in the years leading up to before he died. Gave a presentation right here a couple of years ago before COVID uh, with this experimentation with on the spot queen rearing. You can go online and read all about this and the logic behind it, but the basics of it are when you do your walk away split, this is a variation on a theme of any kind of splitting, but I'm talking about walkway splitting right now. You stick your tool, if you find some cells that are like the perfect age, like if you know exactly what you're looking for with those, and you can read more about what you're looking for with those four day old larvae that have just hatched. If you find the ones that you like a lot, 
you can stick your tool kind of into those cells and smash the bottoms of it like this, and that prevents the bees from having to float the larva up out of the cell so that it has room to grow. They'll just, theoretically, the idea is they'll just build the queen cell right up against that underside, and so it saves them the resources, and it's supposed to produce better queens with a long way split. Um, they don't talk about this in, in this particular slide, but I think that another part of the on-the-spot queen system that makes it better is that you go in a day, whatever this would be after your split, day, I think five, you go in to that same hive that you've done your OTS smash on and you look for capped cells because the capped cells on day five are gonna be all too old. They're gonna be the four day, they're gonna be the, the extra day old larva. And so you smash the capped ones, you leave the uncapped ones, and that prevents the older inferior queen from coming out and killing all of her younger sisters. So uh, I can't remember if, if uh, Mel uh, Diggle, uh, Dissel, no, I don't think I remember if Mel was left. I can't remember if he talks about that explicitly, but it's a good practice if you're gonna use the on the spot computer or something, we're gonna have to do that more. Um, an even better way, Get your queen and drop her in. You can do a walkaway split, and uh, I guess you could argue about whether or not it's technically a walkaway at this point, but if you buy a queen, or if you know somebody locally who has queen cells, they're breeding queens, they have queen cells, you can drop her in, and boom, you've got um, two queen right colonies. Um, the benefit of that is that it if, if you put a queen cell in from a local breeder, um, you're going to save yourself between uh, one to two weeks in like, them taking the time and the effort to make their own queen. You just put one in there for them. Um, if you put a mated queen in, it saves you 27 days of development because you've already made up the time that it takes her to like, sort of get acclimated to her space and get to mating. Um, and these rules about the difference between letting them make their own queen, dropping in a queen cell that somebody locally made for you, or bringing in a mated queen that you purchased, these rules apply to any split. This is not exclusive to the walkaway split. Um, generally speaking, all experienced beekeepers know that if they are in a position where they have to let the bees make their own queen, they're gonna be set back a long ways. And if they're in a position where they can get a queen cell, they're not gonna be set back quite as bad. And if they're in a position where they can put in a mated queen, they are gonna have no break in the brood cycle. The brood are just gonna keep on rocking and that growth, that two frame per week growth that I originally mentioned, is gonna just keep on going. So um, if you don't do it that way, you got a break where the two frame per week growth stops until they can get quick right. <coughs> so assume, assume that these rules are gonna apply to all future split manipulations that I talk about. Swarm splitting. I found a bunch of different beekeepers calling, calling this by different names or uh, using this name to discuss different types of splits, but I'm just gonna tell you what, what I think of when I think of swarm splitting, which is, you go out there for an inspection one day, and boom, you've got swarm cells, and they're uncapped. For those who don't know, that's a queen cell, that's a queen cell, boom, 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 they're all pointed downward, that might be a capped queen cell. Over here, we've got one there, there, oh man, they're just, they're everywhere. You can even tell them that way, if you can see good, you can see like a little bit of white inside there, so you can see that it's locked and loaded, ready to go. So, shoot dang, my bees are gonna swarm if I don't do something right now. So, uh, good news is, if you've got some extra equipment, you can split those girls. And uh, just, just looking at this one uh, picture, you can see that we've got at least one frame, uh, two frames. Over here, we've got 
this is one frame that looks like that, so please don't like here's another frame. If you don't nick those when you're doing your manipulation and you keep them all intact, you can make you can make a whole other colony out of each one of these frames. Because they got queen cells on those these are ready to go. Um, this is also from Randy Oliver. This is his attempt at visualizing the way that the swarm split works. But the general idea is um, you're, uh, you, you make one colony queenless and make sure that they've got those swarm cells in there. And then the colony that you've got the queen in, you make sure those don't have any swarm cells in them. And there's all sorts of different variations on a the theme on how you can do that. Some beekeepers split them up into a different colony for each frame. Some beekeepers will go in and mash. Um, a bunch of those queen cells so that only one queen survives. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but the general idea is you open the colony, you see a queen cell in there, you make two colonies with the existing queen and the frames with queen cells on them. Uh, here's my uh, visual attempt to uh, communicate this. Imagine that these yellow frames represent frames with honey on them. This is a queen right colony that I've opened up and these Red frames are frames with brood, and the green frames will be frames with brood plus uh, queen cells on each of those frames. What I might do, and I have done this many years, and I know uh, Kathy Misko prefers to do something similar to this, where she just waits for her colonies to get swarming and start producing swarm cells, and then she splits them up. So the parent colony has zero green frames, zero swarm frames in it. And uh, I know some folks leave, will leave some sealed brood with the queen, some will leave some of the queen, some both. Um, but if you leave her with at least one resource frame, that's the honey that we were talking about earlier, uh, and pollen. And then the other colonies, however many frames with swarm cells on them you got, you could make that many other colonies. Or you could just put all three frames into one box and have two total colonies at the end of it. But, uh, I, I've done this for a couple of years and have really good results. Um, if you're going to do it this way, read a little bit online for a little bit more detail about how to make sure this queen doesn't leave. Because on a rare occasion, I, I have done this manipulation before, or maybe I missed a queen cell or something, but I had a situation where the queen swarmed anyways, and that colony was just queenless. Uh, and I had to backtrack it. But um, yeah, that's the basic gist of swarm splitting. Uh, the advantages are that you don't really have to be proactive as long as you've got enough equipment. As soon as you see the swarm cells, you get to work. Um, it's pretty fast. It's a great way to deal with swarm cells. If you uh, go a little slow on making sure your colleagues have enough space, you might not have a choice but to do a swarm split this year. Uh, I've certainly done swarm splits that I was not planning on. Um, it's supposed to be the highest quality queens that you can produce are swarm, swarming queens because the whole idea is the bees have everything that they need. They're, they've done a good job, they got an A plus, they're ready to graduate to the next level, which is reproducing, and so those queens are supposed to be like really high quality, they're fed well, they got tons of resources. Um, you can usually make more than one. Uh, it's rare for me to do a swarm split in a case where I've only got one frame that's loaded with all the queen cells. Usually there's multiple frames, so I get to choose. Am I going to turn this into two colonies? Am I going to turn it into eight colonies? I've done that before. Um, the disadvantages to this method is if you're out there, the general rule of thumb is if you're out there and there's a capped queen cell, your queen's probably already gone. So she leaves once those cells start getting capped. So you have to get this kind of perfect timing of your inspection where you open it up and there's definitely queen cells in there, but none of them have been capped yet. So you're in that, that day window. Um, not one day, but it's like a five, five, six, four. So kind of time it pretty perfectly. Um, you can, of course, do the same split if you've got capped cells in there and it's just full of capped queen cells. You lost your old queen probably, and you can still split those up, but you have to make sure to leave at least one in that colony, otherwise they're going to end up queenless if you didn't have all those swarm frames. Um, the other disadvantage is if you split into a bunch of individual colonies, 
it's extremely unlikely that you're going to have a foraging force populous enough, strong enough, to collect extra honey for you to rob at the end of the summer. So uh, this is a great way to make lots and lots more colonies, and not, not as good, depending on making the manipulation, um, for uh, having two colonies that are just going to be raging when the, when the honey flow starts. Okay, the reverse split. Some of these are uh, just kind of making simple things as complicated as we can. Um, before I talk about the reverse split, though, I want to make an aside about nukes. This dude's name is Mike Palmer, and he has a bunch of lectures on YouTube. This one was at the National Honey Show way back in 2013, and he called the presentation the Sustainable Apiary. And uh, his tone, his speaking tone, really uh, just sort of rubs me the wrong way. And so it was very difficult for me to muscle through the presentation. But if you muscle through it, it's awesome information about how he uses lots of nukes as part of his natural operation to keep his colony strong, to sustain the number of colonies that he wants to sustain. So uh, this is Ian Sepler. He does the same thing. He keeps about one third of his colonies as nukes, and then the other two thirds are his production colonies. Randy Oliver does something similar. Increase Essentials, uh, which is by uh, Lawrence uh, Connor. He talks about the same thing. I don't know of any like large-scale beekeeper who's very successful, who is not currently running some sort of nuke operation that's not just to sell nukes, but it is to support their existing uh, uh, operation. And this is an old method that some sometimes seems to have got forgotten in the sands of time and then reemerges and then forgotten again and reemerges. But suffice it to say, lots of beekeepers who keep more than a few colonies will try to maintain a couple of nukes at least, nukes being like little mini colonies, uh, colonies that are smaller than a big production colony that are going to produce a bunch of honey for you, but they're just sort of sitting in the wing in case something happens, like you lose a queen, or if you come in and there's a queen that's just, uh, you know, super aggressive and hot as a firecracker and you're like thinking about giving a beekeeper because she's stinging you all up, and so you're smasher in a fit of rage and, and you can do that comfortably knowing that you've got a queen in the wing waiting for you. There's a, there's a million different reasons why one might want to keep nukes lying around. Um, uh, you're welcome to, I, I would direct you to any of these resources, they're all fantastic resources for how to keep nukes and what to do with them. But I have to demonstrate to you the value of nukes before we talk about the reverse split because it's basically making a nuke. What you do with the reverse split is uh, you find you a new box, top and bottom. You're going to remove a few frames of brood and place them in the new box. Let's see if my animation works here. Oh, yeah. And you're going to find a queen. You're going to move her to the new hive. You basically subtract the laying potential out of the colony, out of the parent colony, and you move that queen somewhere else. And you basically make her into a new. So she's healthy, presumably. She was successful last year. So you don't want to mash her. But um, the colony's growing too fast, or you just want to make increase, or you get in there and you find some swarm cells and you want to do it, you want to do it up differently. You can pull the queen out and send her somewhere else. She needs support, she needs a staff, she needs nurse bees, she needs some open brood that just sort of keeps everybody uh, knowing that this is their central hive. She needs some resources. That's what I, I added that yellow frame in there for you to help you understand that. But basically the idea is you're just pulling the heart out of the colony, self-sustaining, and you're putting it in a smaller box so it sets that colony back a little bit. Um, and then, of course, you can, like I said in those previous slides, you can let them raise their own queen. Maybe they've got swarm frames, or you can drop, if, if they don't have swarm, swarm frames, you can drop a queen cell in there that you bought from somebody, or you can buy a queen. If you don't know how to find uh, access to local queens or queen cells, talk to anybody uh, on the board, uh, knows people, uh, basically through networking, uh, how, how, to get, how to get a queen for manipulation you're trying to do. This is a basic idea of the reverse split. And this is a variation on that same thing. This is called the artificial swarm. This beekeeper is trying to mimic what happens during the swarm 
where the queen and all of the older foraging beekeepers uh, leave the colony to go start a new colony somewhere else, leaving mostly the young bees, brood, and resources behind. This is like basically what happens during a swarm. And so beekeepers in the past have tried to mimic that by somehow pulling the queen and then they'll still pull up, this, this red line is meant in this illustration to represent at least one frame of brood. They'll still pull some brood to make sure that the queen knows that like this is her home and where she's supposed to stay. But you know, they'll pull, in this case, they'll pull uh, most of the colony out and move it somewhere else without the queen, leave the queen in place. And so all the foragers that are going out for the day are coming back home to here. And even when they leave this, like I said previously, even when they leave this um, split that you've made, they're going to end up coming back to the Queen Rat Colony because that was the original location that they were coming back to, so that's what they're oriented to. So you end up at the end of the day with a lot of the older bees. This is, I, in my view, this is similar to the uh, reverse split, but what's different about it here, what you're doing specifically, is you're making sure that all the oldest bees are with the queen, so it's more like what it would be like during a split. It's also really important when you do this to make sure that you have a frame at least that's empty with drawn comb. Don't be filling this thing up with foundation frames and make them build all their own comb because the queen will have no place to lay, and she might not like that. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? Uh, 45 minutes? Hey, not bad. I drug it out really long. Cool. Um, there's even more goodies to come. But uh, let's talk about the do little method real quick. Um, increase essentials is where you can learn a lot more about this. And also, do little, I believe, has his own method for making queens and all sorts of other stuff. But this is just basically about the do little method of making splits. The idea here, oh man, Brian suggested that I bring a uh, demonstration. I and I didn't do it. But the idea is, okay, this is your starting point. This is your parent colony. Too many bees, too much brood. Queen's doing great. Your friends are going to swarm because they're just raging in there. So what you do is you pull your box off and you shake all the bees down into that bottom box. Most beekeepers when they do this don't work real hard to find the queen because if you just shake every bee down there, eventually the queen's going to make it down. It's nice to kind of look for her though because you don't want to accidentally knock her brains out as you're shaking them. <laughs> but if you don't find her, it's not the end of the world. The uh, theory is you got her down there somehow. Once all the bees are in the bottom box, um, no, wait, I need to make sure that I time this right. So I think. Probably the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you've got the frames you want in the top box and the frames you want in the bottom box. The top box is going to be the frames that you rob from this colony at the end of the day. So whichever frames you like that you want to send into your nukes, you make sure they're in the top one. Then shake them all down into that bottom box. Put the queen excluder on that bottom box and then put your, put your box that has all of the frames you want to seal now back on top, lid, walk away. And what's going to happen is all the frames that have brood on them up there, the nurse bees are going to quickly run right back up the queen excluder and hang out on those frames to take care of and nurse those eggs, larvae, and capped brood. Come back the next morning, and now you know. This is another tricky way of separating the casts, because now you know that these are just full of brood and food and nurse bees. And now you can go take them. You don't have to search for the queen. You don't have to do any fancy trickery. You can just start throwing these frames in them. I know that uh, Ian Stepler uses this method to uh, do all of his splits. He just runs through it. And the other nice thing about that is that uh, you can just sort of do the same thing for every single time. It's just blow and go. You don't have to stop and you know, think about the philosophy of life at each colony. You just do it all, and then you leave it and go over there. Um, same thing. Next day, you know that all the top boxes have the frames that you want in them. You know exactly how many frames they've got in each one, and then you can just come back with your boxes and just unload them into those boxes, and you know that all you're pulling out is nurse bees and brood and what you need. So once again, there's a bunch of different ways to do this differently and kind of bleed it into 
you know, maybe you think of this like a walk-away split and you let them make their own, you know, you have eggs in here. So let's not, let's not make it grayer than it already is. But uh, this is the general idea of the is trying to do a little more work now, save you now, save you later. Advantages, you don't need to find a queen. Nobody's got time for that. Um, it's, it's better in the sense that it isolates those nurse bees from the foragers. Um, can also be used for equalizing. I know Ian Stepler used this method to equalize sometimes, so any frames that he, um, if he's got a, some colonies that are weaker, but have a good laying queen, they're just not quite where he wants them to be, but he has no reason to think they're not gonna be a productive colony for this year. Uh, he can do this do little method on the colonies that are uh, rich with bees and rob those frames to feed back to them. So you can use these, you know, say about all these, all these Venn diagram bubbles overlapping. Um, disadvantages is it does take more time, especially up front, um, when you're going through those colonies, it certainly uh, takes more time than uh, like the walkaway split, for example, or the, the swarm splitting. Um, also, nobody talks about this, but it's pretty disruptive. I think that's intuitive, right? When you think about shaking all those bees down there. How much um, chaos and disarray are we injecting into the colony by just throwing all the kids into one big room and then making them sort it out? Um, I don't know that, I mean, productive, successful commercial beekeepers use this method, so I don't know that I'd hang my head on that disadvantage, but it's just more a theoretical question than it is a, a fact. Okay, we talked a lot about merging. Or excuse me, we talked a lot about splitting, now let's talk about, let's talk about merging a little bit. I've been talking about, uh, hey, you've got too many bees, which is like the common problem to have coming out of winter. I would say it's more likely you're gonna have to address having too many bees, and you were gonna have to address having not enough bees. But it happens. Let's say you're keeping four colonies right now, when you go out and two are right where you want them to be, and two are halfway where you want them to be. Maybe one of them has a decent laying queen, too. They're just weak, and maybe they got a knock on them going through winter. Uh, I had one colony this last season where uh, the top blew off right before it started raining. That uh, cut the colony way back, but I checked on them this Wednesday and the queen still there doing great. They were an awesome colony. They just got a kick in the knee and uh, they need a boost. And so I'm going to merge them maybe with another colony that is weaker and just put those bees together. Uh, so, yeah, why? You've got at least two colonies that are less than ideal. Uh, you can tolerate having fewer colonies. Um, the problem with just doing the opposite of a walk-away split, just putting them both together and be like, be friends, is uh, <laughs> queens and their colonies don't like the other queens. So I have made this mistake before where you put one box on top of another box, the two queens go find each other and merge them. Or, the bees from one colony will kill one colony's queen, and the bees from the other colony kill the other colony's queen. So um, they end up with no queen, and that's not good. So uh, we don't want to. We don't want that to happen. Uh, the good news is that there's a trick, because uh, this is all based on smells, I guess theoretically. So so if we can get them to slowly start smelling the same things, then the idea is eventually they'll start to become okay with this other queen because the bees have like a three day memory. And so after about three days, whatever they've been smelling the last three days is like, that's who the queen is. And so your steps are, find a queen you like the least, murder her, and then put a newspaper on top of whatever your parent colony is, uh, and then place colony two on top of colony one. Doesn't matter which of those two queens you kill, but you can't, I would not advise you to have both of them, because that can cause problems later. Um, you can also uh, mash both queens if they both sink, and you can buy a queen via the other methods that we talked about in the past. Or uh, you might be able to rear a queen on your own, and it's sicker right there if you're merging colonies. But the general idea is you're putting these two colonies together to go from two weak to one strong, and um, you have to buffer the pheromones in there so you're using a piece of newspaper 
what happens here is that over the course of a few days, that they don't like that newspaper, so they'll start chewing it up and putting it away. But as they do, like they're making slightly bigger and bigger and bigger holes in that newspaper, and the smells equalize, and this tempers them because they think this is just the normal smell of their normal clean, and it's you know changing a little bit. So that's the idea of merging. Um, like I said, I have to merge. I probably do more merging in the fall. You can do this. You can do any of these manipulations in the fall, but I would strongly recommend that you do not split in the fall. And I would strongly recommend that if you've got weak colonies in the fall that you're going into the winter with, consider merging them. Because better to take two colonies that are weak, put them together to make one colony, sail through the winter strong, and then divide them back into two again at the next season than it is to go into winter with two weak colonies, lose one, and then come out with one weak colony. Um, lots of beekeepers do that. Sometimes they call it taking a loss in the winter. That was a bunny trail, not what I was supposed to be talking about, but merging. Stay tuned for later in the season. Um, finally, equalizing. Um, equalizing has kind of become my new favorite thing in the last couple of years. Um, I bet you can guess what it is. Actually, I probably already told you. But um, let's pretend that you've got as many colonies as you want. Let's go back to having four colonies. And um, one colony, have, like the average number of bees in each colony is really good. But some colonies have a lot, and some colonies don't have quite as much. But you still feel strong about the queens. You don't necessarily need to replace the queens. You just want to level everybody off. And one of the benefits of leveling everybody off is, again, you don't have to ponder the philosophy of life with every single colony. You can just go out there and treat them all the same, and you're done. And then you kind of only have to think about one colony. Um, I draw a lot of benefit from this approach. And like I said, other, I, I know that there are a lot of commercial beekeepers who use this method. It's about as simple as it sounds. Uh, what I am going to do in two weeks when I equalize my own colonies is I'm going to take a box out there into the yard. I'm going to go to the strongest colony first. I'm going to cut them down by pulling frames of brood with nurse bees on them out. Make sure you don't accidentally take the queen, so you do have to search for the queen with the way that I'm describing doing this. Um, load them up into your empty box and then go to the next colony. And if they're weak, you can take your frames from that colony and put them in. If they're strong, you can take more of those, and you just go in and you just cut down all the strong ones, and you use your leavings to build up the weak ones. Um, this will probably work better if I use the do little method in conjunction with that, where I shook all of these down and then excluded them and had them come up on the frames, and then I would know that I was getting nurse bees, so whenever I move them to a new Hive, they wouldn't be able to uh, complain and go back to their original colony because they're not flyers yet, so they're just stuck wherever I put them. Um, and generally, their nurse bees are going to be true to the brood more than they are going to be true to the queen. So you move them with a frame of brood on them, and they're just going to honor that frame of brood. Um, so this is the basic principle of, of equalizing: um, is that you just kind of want everybody to be the same. Um, I could argue or try to make a case for you for why philosophically equalizing is always good, but um, I think the best sales pitch is just I started doing it and I loved it and I didn't stop. So I have you beat that. Okay, well, I didn't give you the 90 minutes that I promised you, but I gave you an hour anyways, and um, I would love to answer any questions, and there's a bunch of old time beekeepers that I'm sure want to type in. I have two questions. One, uh, is it possible for a, a newly hatched queen to mate with a drone inside the hive? No. I mean, is it possible? Yeah. Or do they do that? They don't. They, um, you know, for whatever reason, they know well enough to know that to prevent any breeding, they need to get up and get out. Um, so beekeepers uh, generally accept the philosophy that if they're going to raise their own queens to be mated, they're going to mate with drones from somewhere else, and that's a tricky circle to uh, spur to circle. Or circle to spur. Um, so beekeepers are always trying to find different ways to manage that. And my second question Eric, is: you, Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sorry. The que that original question was: uh, Does the queen ever mate with a drone inside her own colony? Basically, no. Yeah. 
And my second question is, if you're using newspapers to merge two colleges, and, you know, I did this once a couple of years ago. I had two so-so colonies that were one box. They weren't doing nothing. It was getting to be fall, and I just put some newspaper on there and dump them on there together. Yeah, when they start eating through that newspaper and smell the vines, are they just going to be one big happy family and have people eat and not know it? I would expect lower rate of success combining two queens, though I wouldn't say that it's going to be consistent. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So to repeat the question, the question was, what if you merge two colonies without mashing one of the queens? Will they live happily ever after with two colonies in there? Um, first, I should say, it is not impossible for two queens to live happily in a colony. We know that some colonies do great with, like, I think we're thinking that generally those are like mother-daughter queens. So sometimes, on a rare occasion, a colony will get through winter with a daughter, and they'll come out really busting. But, um, like, why are those queens okay with each other? Is it because the smells were equalized from the get-go? Or is it because uh, like somehow they know they're related? It seems unlikely to me that they would know that. Um, so um, I would, I personally would let go of one of those queens to prevent the possibility that even if all the other bees in the hive love to smell and feel like, yeah, we're one big happy family, the two queens might be like, who the heck are you? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just a second. No, let, me, let me bring the mic back to you so we are yeah, Billy, you run around. Sounds like that Sorry, can you say that again? If you're splitting the hives, do you move the one that you split to be moved that far, far away, or can you leave them right there together? That's a great question. Um, so the question was, uh, well, everybody heard it. Am I right? I don't need to repeat them anymore. Uh, if I turn this on again, let it go weird. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, so yeah, if you split two hives, do you have to move one far, far away or not? Um, I would say if you're doing a walk away split, just keep it simple, stupid, as easy as can be, and that's all you're going to do, yeah, moving them far away would be great, because then you're not going to have that accidental scenario where um, you know all your foragers return back to the parent colony. You know, if you move them two miles away, they're going to have to reorient. Some beekeepers will put like a bush or something in front of the colony so that when the foragers leave, they see that something's different, and so that cues them that they need to reorient. I love doing that, um, but. Uh, again, with some of these more complicated manipulations where you're pulling just the, if you know that you're pulling just the nurse bees out of the colony, generally you can put them right next to the same colony and they're not going to move over because again, they're, they're not flyers, so they're not going to fly until at least two weeks after they hatched and, and probably more than that. So they're not going to fly out and they've got brood to take care of, so they're just going to stay with that frame of brood they're not going to leave. So you can cheat and not move the colony far, far away as long as you know which casts are going where. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you do this later in the day so that? Good question. The foragers are already gone. You know. Right. Do you do it later in the day or what? Uh, so so it, let's pretend like it's noon and I'm going up to the bee yard. It's there's not going to be 100% of the foragers gone. There's going to be like quite a few foragers and they're still doing their thing. Beekeepers just generally love to do their inspections and any sort of manipulations, usually in the middle of the day, because the colony's a little bit weaker. All the foragers who are you know, also more likely to sting you and more likely to be like, what's going on, um, are going to be out doing their work and they're going to be hopefully happy and collecting lots of resources. So during the day is a great time to do most manipulations. Again, I could probably imagine a scenario where I was trying to be really clever and I wanted as many uh, foragers to be in there for some reason because I was going to do a manipulation in such a way that I was going to trick the foragers into doing something else or going somewhere else. For example, um, if I was doing a split where I wanted the foragers to stay with the colony and I was going to take them somewhere else far, far away, 
I might want to do that later in the day, perhaps, because then I'm thinking I'm going to get lots more foragers. They're going to have all night to sleep on all the successful day they had. And then when they wake up, they're going to realize they're in a different place. I've hopefully helped them to realize that. And so when they reorient, they're less likely to get lost when they come out. So yeah, I can, I can probably think of a scenario like that. But generally speaking, you're just going to do law of averages. Most of these manipulations are good to do in the middle of the day. Thank you. Eric, isn't it also important that you uh, watch the temperature, the ambient temperature? You don't want to do it uh, split when it's too cold. Oh, uh, that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you, James. So, restate the question. So the, the question was, isn't it true that when you're doing these splits, you want to be mindful of the out, outside air temperature because if it's too cold and you do your splits, you can lose your colony. Yeah, I think uh, that's absolutely right. The way that I would choose to frame that question is. Um, there's a relationship that bees are strength. That whole idea of the relationship of bees and strength means that a stronger colony is going to be able to weather cold weather better. So if you, for example, want to go out and do a swarm split where you're dividing, let, let's say you've got four or five frames that have swarm cells on them, and you think, I don't have a ton of equipment, I don't have any other bees to add to this box, so I'm just going to split these up into four little colonies that only have one frame on them, one frame of bees and a queen, and it's, you know, you put your frame of honey in there, but there's a chance that the temperatures get below 55 degrees or even, I, I wouldn't do that if it was going to get below 75 degrees at night. Uh, you can certainly lose that colony because those bees, there's just not enough bees there to keep that space warm. Now I might, if I thought it was going to get cold for the next week, I might still do the manipulation, but split them into two strong colonies instead of like four weaker colonies, if that makes any sense. So I'm, I'm definitely going to be thinking about what's the temperature going to be for the next week, two weeks, four weeks, what are the odds that we're going to have a cold snap? And so like, wh my, what am I gambling by dividing these up into more colonies? I'm, I'm risking losing some of them, but you know, if I, if I make a good bet, maybe, maybe I get a whole bunch of extra colonies. Yes, sir. I went to my colleagues last week and a couple of them like to split, but I don't see any drones in there. So do you need to wait to see you see drones before you start making splits? Yeah, that's a great question. The 11th, okay, so the question was, do you need to see drones before you start making splits? So, you know, I had, if you remember my outline up here, I said splits and uh, splitting and timing. And then I didn't say a word about timing today, so shame on me. Um, but yes, do not go home tonight and start splitting your colonies up because they got too many bees in them. Now is not the time to do that. Uh, it's a little too soon. Uh, I did see purple eyed drones in my colonies on Wednesday. So there are, by purple eyed drones, I mean drones that have uh, been hatched as eggs. They've been raised as larvae, they've capped, they've pupated, and as they're pupating in that cocoon, you know, I, I open up the box and it, they build drones between the two frames and it tore some drone comb open, and I could see the pupa in there, and her, his eyes had already turned purple, which means he's very close to hatching. Plan on at least two weeks for them to, after they hatch, get to walking around and figure out which way's up, and then the next two weeks they're gonna start flying and they're gonna get better at flying. I read yesterday that after 28 days, the, the, the consensus is that their, their quality starts to, to diminish. But yeah, if you've got no drones, you don't wanna be trying to make queens. And, uh, but at the same time, if you're buying a mating queen, and somehow miraculously you're able to get a mating queen Today, theoretically, you can split two into two strong colonies now. But yeah, if you're going to have them make their own queens, you need to wait until there's at least walking drums that you find in the colony. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you're going to do a swarm split, would you move those far away, or is it okay to keep them fairly close? Yeah, good question. If you're going to do a swarm split, what I described there, would you move those far away? Last time I did one, I didn't. I never did. And it worked pretty good. Um, once again, 
generally what you're getting as you're doing your swarm split is whatever bees are coming with you on the brood are the nurse bees and they're going to stay put and then any bees that fly out of that colony you didn't want them anyway because they were foragers and they're not going to do diddly squat for your for your brood and so um, they're going to fly out they're going to end up coming back to the queen right colony and if you strip her down right you're going to end up with Queen and mostly foragers, similar to the swarms. But yeah, right. Okay. One thing you gotta think of too is when you're making a split like that, if you've got a strong, the overhive is stronger, the weak, the needle hive is weaker. One thing you can do is if you don't want to move them a long distance, you can take them and move the existing colony a few feet away, the old colony a few feet away, but the new co colony you're putting where the old one was. Then you're going to be hitting all the foragers back into that spot, which will strengthen that colony to start with. Also, foragers will actually, if there's a role to be played, sometimes that the, there's not enough nurse bees in there, they will actually go do a little nursing too. You know, oh, okay. back to, so awesome. you've got the option there of building your colony up by just moving them around, shifting them around. Everybody hear that okay? Real quick, I'm going to get to your question, but real quick, what I hope Marty, his explanation, and my explanation too, is helping you to understand, is that who goes in the parent hive location, and who comes out of it, and how far away they go, is pretty much all about the casts. The workers uh, divided into nurses and foragers. So wherever you want the foragers to be, they're gonna come back to generally that, unless you move them really far away. They're gonna come back to that parent colony, so, However you're doing your manipulation, you, you can get real clever if you want to try to split the atom of this thing, but, but ultimately what's going to happen is wherever the parent colony was, that's generally where your forgers are going to come back to, unless you move them far, far away. And then wherever you put the brood, then that's going to be where the nurseries want to be. Yeah, go ahead. You keep saying close by, far away. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's far is very far away. relative, you know, so like is it. Right. Is it, Three miles is it so can you elaborate a little right. bit? Right. Yeah, at least what? one state away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For silly, we live on the border. <laughs> right, yes, yeah, so I can still only compete. So so the question was, how far away is far away anyways? Um, I uh, have heard many different statistics on how far foragers will fly. Some people have heard like they really don't like to fly further than a mile. I know that uh, in Honeybee Democracy, uh, Tom Seeley uh, records having witnessed a honeybee travel 10 kilometers, which would be six miles. That's a long way. I think the, the generally accepted consensus is about two miles is their familiar and favorite foraging radius. So when we say move far away, it's two miles or more. Okay. Is the idea. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you know, that's great, good question. How do you know you gotta have good quality drones in the area anyways? And you know what I'm worrying about with that specifically, I've been thinking about this recently, because where we're located, we're right on the edge of like the Raytown Plateau, right as you descend into the Little Blue River Valley. So you know there's gonna be a totally different microclimate in the Little Blue River Valley than there is way up on the plateau where we are. And so if it's like five degrees cooler on average, does that mean that those drones are like two weeks behind? So even if I see walking drones in my own colony, and the closest drone congregating areas that our queen can reach are uh, not ready with drones yet, then what do you do? A lot of beekeepers use a, I think a lot of experienced beekeepers will use just like a set date, like they'll say, uh, April 1st, I'm gonna start raising queens, or April 15th, I'm gonna start raising queens. And that way I just know, if you set it out far enough that, um, that you're going to be guaranteed to have drones. Um, you know, I could I could like deflect this question and say this question is really more about raising queens than it is about making splits. Um, and but you know, to, to be responsible with your question, I would say April fifteenth is a good good safe date, generally speaking. Um, you can also, if you're concerned, start a little bit later and start in May, and you know, there's going to be a lot of crazy drones out. Look at the you know do the thing. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I, I, that's the, and hopefully I threw enough words at that to make it coherent. 